So I'm Frank Corey with the Conservation District, and I spent five or six years, I think, working almost exclusively with the drainage improvement districts here in Whatcom County, providing technical assistance to get permits to do drainage and actually help on site during drainage maintenance. Um, so I got a pretty good handle on it from the field side and from the permit side and the regulatory side and everything like that. And like Nicole said, please interrupt me anytime you want if you got questions. Um, I see a couple of regulatory people over here. Maybe if I get anything wrong, interrupt me. That's fine. We want to get it right here today. And I, I guess drainage, the way I think of it is, for dairies in particular, the, the most important thing to you is probably economics, right? You've got to make, get enough for your product to pay for your expenses, make it worth being in business. Beyond that, there's a whole bunch of things that are important in western Whatcom County. Western Washington drainage is probably near the top. We live in a really wet environment. The fields are saturated in the wintertime. They need to drain off in the spring and through the growing season. That's the given. That's the premise of this talk. Um, the last qualification I'll make is that I'm the messenger here today, and you don't shoot the messenger. So. <laughs> Uh, laws and regulations. I won't belabor this too much, but it is good to have a little background. Um, Title 85, the Revised Code of Washington, is what allows landowners and special districts, primarily drainage improvement districts, to establish and maintain their drainage. It does not require that you... Sorry, Andrew. It does not require that you maintain drainage. It allows you to do that. Uh, drainage Improvement District, through that law, can maintain drainage. They're not mandated to. A landowner can maintain drainage. They're not mandated to. For instance, if this landowner drains onto this landowner, this landowner is not obligated to maintain drainage for landowner A, but they can through the law. The Hydraulic Code of Washington is what enables the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife to regulate activities within surface waters. Surface waters can be rivers, streams, ditches, all kinds of things like that, and we'll get into some of those differences later. Water Pollution Control Acts, both state and federal, um, regulate the quality of water. This is important for drainage maintenance because pretty much anything you do in the water is going to impact the water quality. And you have to maintain compliance with the Water Pollution Control Acts while you're maintaining drainage. And finally, the Growth and Shorelines Management Acts of the State of Washington, which is what the Whatcom County Critical Areas Ordinance comes from. Um, a critical area, again, can be a river, a stream, a ditch, a wetland, many things like that. Permits to maintain drainage may include a hydraulic project approval from the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. The State Environmental Policy Act, or SEPA, is a component of getting that HPA. Um, you may need a shorelines permit if you're in a shoreline stream, which are the bigger streams. And you may need a land disturbance permit from Whatcom County. And you may need a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers, although that's typically not the case. So, this is what you want to know, right? I, do I need a permit to clean my ditch? The answer is very simple. It all depends. I don't know. <laughs> you might. In many cases, you might. One thing that we're really going to... Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> what if I fall now? Jeez. Water course classification is kind of the key to the whole thing. There's natural water courses. We've sort of divided these things up in con consultation with other agencies. There's natural water courses, there's modified natural water courses, and there's constructed water courses. Natural water course is probably non-existent in the agricultural areas of Whatcom County. They're that pristine little stream up in the mountains that's never been straightened, it's never been levied, it's never been diked, anything like that. It's a natural stream. Modified natural water course is very common in the agricultural areas. It's a natural stream that's been straightened, uh, 
heavy dike, all the vegetation stripped off, all the things that we've done to enable agriculture, um, typically agriculture, sometimes development, um, succeed. And finally, constructed water courses are also common. They start in a field. They do not come from springs. They do not come from established wetlands. They do not have headwaters. They start in a field and they flow into another constructed ditch or maybe a modified water course or something like that. We're going to belabor this point a little bit because it's important, these three water course classifications. So again, constructed water course, this is classic. It starts right here in the middle of this field simply to drain the field. It has no headwaters. It does not come from a wetland. It does not come from a spring. Modified water course might look the same as a constructed water course. It might look like a straight ditch because it was turned into a straight ditch. But it has headwaters. It was a natural stream. Uh, it drains a wetland. Many, many, many reasons why it's a modified natural water course. This is uh, a pretty typical situation. We've got this big forested wetland up here. If this ditch didn't start in the middle of the field, if it started at the edge of the field at that wetland, then that's a modified natural water course and not a constructed water course, because it's draining that wetland. It's conveying that water just like it always has. <coughs> and finally, the natural water course. Um, I can't even think of a good lowland example. Maybe Chuckanut Creek in Royal Park, South Bellingham, if any of you have ever been there. It's still pretty well forested. It still meanders. It's still got gravel, all that kind of stuff. Going to belabor just a little bit more, just to make sure we all understand this. Natural water course up here. This is probably a hill. The stream still meanders through it. It's still forested. It hasn't been disrupted that much. Modified natural water course. Once it hits the flat ground, it's been straightened. It's been curved. It's been 90 degree turns for it, all kinds of things like that and constructed water course. This is a pretty <coughs> classic one here. It starts in the middle of the field and it flows into the modified natural. This is one you would want to look at because it's pretty close to the hillside here. Is that actually a little bit of a stream channel coming down or maybe a natural spring or something? I don't know. I'm, from the aerial, I would call it a constructed <coughs> water course. Is it really? I don't know. This one, the drains the barn gutters, pretty much a constructed water course. Constructed water course maintenance. Generally, you don't need a permit with some qualifications now. If the ditch or field ditch or whatever it is is on a farm and it's covered by your farm conservation plan and drainage maintenance is in that plan and that plan is filed with Whatcom County and approved, then you shouldn't need a permit to maintain that ditch. If you want to know for sure, I would recommend checking with the Department of Fish and Wildlife because, like I was pointing out in that last aerial photo, it's really hard to know for sure what's constructed, what's modified, natural. If you want to know, they'll send out their habitat biologist. He'll sort of check for fish, he'll check for habitat, and he will provide you with certainty about that. Even if it is a constructed water course, even if you don't need a permit, you still can't do a few things. If it's full of salmon, you can't kill them just because it's a constructed ditch. You can't send a muddy plume of water down into a modified natural or a natural stream. And timing is everything. Typically, a field ditch goes dry at some point in the summer. Go for it then. That's the time to do it. You're not going to have any downstream impacts at that point. Modified natural water course. Most I don't know about most. An awful lot of the what we think of as ditches in Whatcom County are probably modified natural water courses. We've got a little bit more elevation here than down in the Skagit Flats, for instance. A lot of streams have been straightened over the years. Certainly a lot of the ag areas were wetlands, which are now ditched and drained and turned into viable fields. 
So the majority of water courses, other than the little field ditches that you're going to be dealing with, are probably modified natural. And yes, you do need permits for those. The place to start, again, is with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They'll send their habitat biologists out. Um, a little consultation about it, give you some ideas of what you need. By law, you're probably going to have to mitigate. When you go in and dredge out a channel, you're removing not only the fish, but whatever fish habitat is there. Reed canary grass is not great fish habitat, but it's better than nothing. And that's what we're talking about is removing all of that. You still can't kill the fish. And there are probably fish window times. And we'll talk about all these things in a little more detail. The natural water course maintenance, you really don't. Yeah, that's just not going to happen. So, um, this don't try to read this too close. But these are different drainage maintenance practices and different agencies that you might have to contact. So obviously, the constructed water courses, the field ditches. There's not much you have to do. The different practices for modified land water course. There are some hoops to jump through. Absolutely. Uh, beaver dams, I love this picture, <laughs> happy beaver, um, same permitting requirements almost, um, assuming it's in a modified channel, modified natural channel, um, although there is a new simplified permit system from the Department of Fish and Wildlife just in the last few months, it's a simple one page application, um, you still, for them to issue the permit they still need the SEPA exemption from Whatcom County. But in the past, that's been pretty easy just for dealing with a beaver dam or two. So that process has gotten considerably easier in the last year or so. This is pretty much the agricultural area of Whatcom County. And it's divided up into many special districts. And a lot of the special districts have the ability to, to maintain drainage. The first set of those are the diking districts, in particular, well, I guess all of them historically have done some drainage maintenance. This one does on an almost annual basis by dimming. Um, the one down near the delta doesn't do too much anymore, but probably should. And by law, diking districts can do a certain amount of drainage if it's involved in their maintaining their levees and dikes and that sort of thing. The biggest by far are the drainage districts. There are 14 in Lola and Whatcom County, um, encompassing much of the the ag area, and as you might expect, it's all the low flat ground where the drainage districts have popped up. And drainage districts, again, by law, can maintain drainage. More recently, we have some watershed improvement districts, two of them, the Bertrand and the North Linden or Fish Trap. And they have pretty <coughs> broad powers as well. They can also maintain drainage. And finally, the Birch Bay, we can never get this right, Birch Bay Watershed Aquatic Resource Management District. I don't know who came up with that. They have broad powers as well as a special district. They could maintain drainage, but what they're really focused on is, is drainage in terms of stormwater pipes in downtown Birch Bay. They're not out there dredging ditches too much. In the pro program that I worked with through the CD, um, we worked with drainage districts, and one, two, three, four, five, six of them um, went through the process to get a five-year permits from the county and the Department of Fish and Wildlife to maintain drainage. So every time they needed to do something, they did not have to go back out and reapply for a new permit. And these are the districts that have done that. It's worked out pretty well. DID number 21, Scott Ditch, has probably been the most active the last three or four years, and they've gotten some good work done. When you get that five-year permit, um, this is the this is sort of the nuts and bolts of it. It's it's a drainage management plan, kind of like a farm plan, and there's lots of components to it. But this is a key component. Um, again, we're back to that watershed water course classification. The yellow here are the modified natural channels. The green are the constructed channels, and the red are the natural channels. And there are none. This is Scott Ditch no natural channels. Uh, the hashed yellow is actually where this district has easements and has historically maintained drainage. 
Again, typically in drainage districts, I'm not exactly sure why, but most of their maintained channels are the modified natural. The field ditches historically have been maintained by the and <coughs> not by the special district. Um, again, there's no law requiring that, but that's typically the way it works. Mitigation. Somehow the word mitigation has become kind of a an evil term, I know, because it brings up all kinds of things. Hydraulic Code of Washington requires mitigation for impacts to the aquatic environment. Again, that can be impacts to fish, can be impacts to fish habitat. Um, there are negative impacts to fish, primarily game fish is what we're talking about, salmon, cutthroat trout, that sort of thing. If you take an excavator and you pull all the grass and sediments out of a creek, you know, I mean, we don't live in a bubble here. That's, that impacts natural resources above and beyond agriculture that other people care about. Fish out, you're pulling every stick of habitat out. By law, you have to mitigate for that. In the hydraulic code, it says that the preference is for that mitigation to take place on site and in kind. On site means that if this is the stretch of land, you're maintaining that that mitigation should take place there. In kind means if the impact is removing all the habitat, in this case grass maybe, that you have to put something in place to replace that habitat. It can't happen on a real short term, it's a long term thing, so there is some temporal loss. Uh, if there's a reason you can't do it on site and in kind, then you can propose something else, somewhere else. And that's totally acceptable, it happens, but there has to be a reason for that. A reason meaning you've got an opportunity off-site to accomplish something more for the habitat that's lost, for instance. You can't do it on-site because there's a road on both sides of the channel or something and there's just nothing you can do there. Um, those are all legitimate reasons. Not wanting to is not generally looked at as a legitimate reason. <laughs> if, that were, then everyone would take that get out of jail free card, right? Best management practices. When you perform the drainage maintenance, there are things you can do to minimize those impacts. Uh, we're going to kind of go through those. We generally call those BMPs or best management practices. I was in Canada a couple weeks ago. I did a little presentation, and somebody else did one. And he said that up there they're calling them beneficial management practices now. I think they're a little less egotistical in Canada maybe. and not saying this is the best way to do it, but it's a beneficial way to do it. And I think that's the way to look at these. Timing. Fish window is usually August 1st to September 30th. Again, most of these modified natural systems are going to have fish in them whether you see them or not. This time period here is when I don't know if I can say there's the fewest fish, but it's when they're in a life stage that they're less vulnerable. So the eggs are not in the gravel anymore. The little fish that emerge from the gravel, have either some of them have migrated to the ocean by August 1st. The ones that stay in the fresh water are a little bit bigger and they can handle more disturbance. And it's before the adult fish migrate back up and start to, their life cycle over again. Fish protection <coughs> or exclusion. The, again, you can't kill the fish in the channel. Mm -hmm. I know, well, 20 years ago it was the same as it is now, but 30, 40, 50 years ago, we didn't pay a lot of attention. You would go in there and clean out the channel. And, and I've heard stories from a lot of people that you know fish come out with the bucket and all that kind of stuff. And you just can't do that anymore. There's, we don't live in a bubble. You can't do that. Um, the protocol is to remove the fish from the channel prior to work. Generally, this involves hiring a qualified person, a biologist, um, to come through. There's a process, a three-step process, where you sane the channel with the same net twice, and then you electroshock the last little bit to get the rest of the fish out. Um, in a reed canary channel with a peat bottom or something, you can't walk through there dragging a net, can you? It's 
effectiveness is limited, um, but you got to make an effort. And then you put a block net above where you're working, below where you're working, so no more fish can come in. And on top of that, while you're working, you want to have somebody around um, to catch whatever fish and release them before they die. That's actually kind of fun. I've done that with several landowners, and you, you kind of get into it after a while. It's like fishing. Um, and that's actually not that expensive. Um, it doesn't take hours and hours to, to exclude fish from an area. Water quality protection is a different story. You can't send, by law, muddy water downstream of where you're working. The criteria for that is, is um, there's a scale that measures turbidity in the water, how muddy the water is. Um, it's called NTUs, which stands for, Nicole, what does that stand for? NTU? It's, I don't know. Nephilometric. Okay, so if you got pretty clear water, it's the NTU scale is 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 really low, and the, the law says you can't increase it by more than five NTUs. And if you were to drop a fish net into there, to scoop a fish out, you would increase it by more than five NTUs. So it's really really hard to meet that criteria. Um, Department of Ecology is charged with. Um, enforcing the water quality here. If you've got a permit to do dredging, they may or may not come out and monitor it, but if they do, the fines for exceeding that standard are, are substantial. So there's a number of things you can do. Um, you can install silk curtains to back up some water, try to filter it out. Straw bales don't work as well as what I would like, and they're really heavy to get out once you're done with them, which is why you, they're oftentimes left in. You want to do it at the time of the lowest possible flow and the last resort and in many ways the best resort is to divert the water around it. You build a sandbag dam upstream from where you're going to be digging, another one downstream, you pump the water around the work site so you got clean water up high, you pump the clean water in back down low. That's an expensive proposition. Um, it does have some advantage as far as the operator doing the drainage because then they can really see what they're doing. Um, when you got three or four feet of deep muddy water there, the excavator operator is just working blind. So some examples of all these BMPs. Um, this is electrofishing. So this particular stream, um, lucky enough, is one you can walk in. Uh, they drug sand nets down through it a couple of times and now he's going through this little gizmo here up on his back. There's electric uh, battery powered single little shot down through the water and scoops them up with that net. Elder Ditch off Scott Ditch four or five years ago was was cleaned out or dredged. Um, we didn't think there would be a lot of fish in there. It was really hard to do fish exclusion, so we did more fish rescue than fish exclusion. And this is a cutthroat trout that was probably, I don't know, about this long in this little tiny ditch. Um, I wished I'd been fishing for it rather than digging out of the mud, but it was a nice fish. And I like this picture because it shows the size of that fish in an unexpected area, but it also shows that, you know, there's impacts. You try to rescue them all, but you just don't. And you can't put your head in the sand and pretend that there's not any impacts, because there are. This is one of those sediment curtains. This is on Upper Four Mile Creek. And you can kind of see the flow is going this way. So you've got all this muddy water. It backs up behind this. And it's actually pretty effective. Um, you filter out an awful lot of sediment that way. And in this case, the water was pumped down. You've got groundwater coming in, so it's really hard to make it dry in some cases. This was one of those cases. Uh, but it, it definitely helped a lot. Finally, pumping. Um, this is Randy Linquist's pump, I think. So we built a sandbag wall above, pump water around, and then it goes back in below the work site, nice and clean. Uh, we put it on a tarp in this case because you don't want to erode the bank out and send a bunch of muddy, create a bunch of muddy water with your clean water. Um, that's really expensive. So I've kind of done the math and. It, it looks like the BMPs, the fish exclusion, 
the clean water work and that sort of thing pretty much doubles the cost of drainage maintenance. It costs, say, a dollar and a half a foot to pay the guy with the excavator to come through and do the work. It costs about a dollar and a half a foot to follow all the laws and regulations. The cost of doing business, I don't know of any way to reduce those. This is a silk curtain again. This is a bad picture. Um, didn't pump nearly enough water around. This is really muddy water. Once sediment gets suspended in the water like that, it's depending upon your soil type, it stays suspended for a long time. If you've got sand, it's going to fall out pretty quick. If you've got silts or clays or anything like that, it can go downstream for miles. In this case, I kind of came in late on this project. I won't even say where it is, but it went down this stream for maybe two miles, and then you could see a muddy plume going down the Nooksack River for a couple miles after that. And somebody's going to notice that. This, I will tell you where it is. This is Schneider Ditch. Um, pay attention to this old fence crossing here, whatever it is. Pretty classic, modified, natural stream. Um, lots of headwaters to it. Lots of reed canary grass. The water's all backed up. Um, the district there, drainage improvement district number two, I think, wanted to clean it out, so we assisted with getting all the permits and everything in place and mitigation, which we'll get into here again. Um, I had to show some dredging pictures here. So here's the excavator. This is Randy's pump spool up here. So the water has been pumped down. Once the water was pumped down some, the biologists went through, cleared out the fish, which wasn't a lot, but some. Um, banks were all mowed down so the operator could see what he was doing. Those are all good practices. You can kind of see him get closer here now. And this bucket is rather unique. It's a lidded bucket, a big bucket. And the idea there is that he, it's actually required by many permits. As you scoop in, you grab the sediments, the grass, and then you close the bucket while you're still down there in the channel and lift it out so you don't have that big splash of muddy water falling back out of the bucket. Part of the reason to do it that way is it's going to keep that water cleaner. It's going to help you maintain compliance with the Clean Water Act and all that kind of stuff. It also makes the Army Corps of Engineers. Is there anybody here from the Army Corps? I don't think so. They have this weird idea. <laughs> One of, one of the, the things you'll run across, or you might, is that in waters of the U.S., which are most streams and ditches and things like that, or navigable waters, you can't put fill in them. So you don't need a permit from the Army Corps to, take, to dredge it out. But if it, you're putting it in, then you need a, a permit for that, which is fairly lengthy to get. So they have this weird idea that if you're dredging stuff out, and muddy water or sediment drips back in off your bucket, at that point you're putting fill back in. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's the way they see it. So by using a lidded bucket, um, there's a Latin term, de minimis fallback. They think there's going to be so little stuff falling back that they're not concerned about it. So you generally don't, if you use this sort of, this sort of equipment, you generally don't have to get a core permit which helps a lot. Um, so he's coming down here, cleaning it out. I know you guys are just anxious to see him cut out this big clump of reef canary grass here. But I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> so this, there's that, there's that two by six old fence there again. Um, so this was all done. This had been, I don't know, 20 or 30 years since this particular site had been cleaned out for various reasons. and. When it's not regularly cleaned out, a stream wants to meander like this. It's the old high school science thing that if you have a sloping piece of glass and you put water on top, the water will go down this way instead of straight. And that's what happened to this channel. It was starting to meander. So the Department of Fish and Wildlife said, yes, we'll issue a permit and clean it out as long as you mitigate. But we'd really like you to follow the meanders. 
So we, we tried to do that. I mean, it was the meanders in it at that point during low flow were about this wide. And then we went in there with this five foot wide excavator bucket and tried to maintain those. But the scale is just, it's, it was kind of a silly thing to try to do. But that's why it looks like this. It doesn't matter. The more stimulosity you have, the better transport, sediment transport you have anyway. So maybe this was helpful, maybe not. Um, I'm not sure. So I know you'll have questions at the end here, and we're kind of getting towards that. But I want to talk about, so that's, that's the 10 minute version of drainage maintenance. That's what you have to do to do it, and where you can do it and how. This is a little segment on what you can do to reduce the need to do drainage maintenance. I think you've got the idea that it's complicated to do it in some situations. So what can you do to reduce the interval so you don't have to do it as often? Um, one thing you can do is good farm practices. This field, this farm right up to the edge, this is all good soil. It's falling right into the, into the water course. Um, it seemed like a no-brainer to me. If that stuff goes in there, the guy downstream at some point is going to have to get it out of there. And he's modified natural system. It means getting all those permits. It means paying somebody on an excavator. It means paying for, for fish exclusion and water quality, DMPs, and all that kind of stuff. When it would have been easier just to keep it in the field before it ended up down there. This is a um, lower Scott ditch, much better. They've got a big wide. Uh, in this case, I don't think it's a filter strip. I think they planted a relay crop in the first 100 feet or so there near the stream. In either case, it's very effective um, keeping the sediments, the soil in the field and out of the stream. This is, in, in my work at least, a fairly new innovation. And I saw Jim here. He knows all about aquatic herbicides. Um, a lot of the drainage improvement districts have been using those for the last four or five years. This is a reach of California Creek over near Custer um, at Pomeroy's district. And they started using herbicides, um, I don't know if it was four or five years ago, but before this was kind of like that Schneider Ditch picture. It was water level was up here, it was reef and area grass clear across. In the summer, you couldn't see the water, you couldn't see the channel. Um, they didn't dredge it, they didn't do anything except they started going through, they got a permit and started going through with the aquatic herbicide once a year for four or five years. And I'm astounded at how effective that is, has been for drainage. The grass is gone, the stream has actually scoured down and widened a little bit. Um, there's just no doubt that they've accomplished everything they've needed to do just by, by spraying the grass. There's a permit that's a national permit that's held by the Washington State Department of Agriculture. You get it through the Department of Ecology for some reason. Don't ask me why. Um, it's, it might even be free. I'm not sure. It's really inexpensive if you have to pay anything. It's really effective. But again, we don't live in a bubble here. The grass is not great fish habitat, but now there's no fish habitat. There's probably no fish using this reach anymore, these juvenile fish, because there's no place for them to hide. There's no place for them to get out of the sun. There's a lot of controversy now in some circles about whether that permit should continue to be issued for salmon bearing streams. And they have a point, but in the meantime, it's really, really effective. Another thing that's really effective I mean, grass, meaning reed canary grass, which I know was introduced by NRCS, among others, years ago. And I see NRCS guys in the back here. It's their fault. Blame them. It fills up the channel. It traps sediment. It's the problem. Um, but it's not going away. You can spray it. you got to keep spraying it every year. That's expensive. Um, this is California Creek, really near that last picture I just showed you. So just upstream from here. That same year, four or five years ago, we planted native shrub buffers along that stretch. Didn't, again, didn't dredge it, didn't do anything else. I measured some cross sections on this site. 
and on that herbicide site last summer, and they're exactly the same now. Once you get that reed canary grass out, whether you do it from shading it out, it can't grow underneath the tree canopy, or whether you spray it out or whether you remove it, the result has been exactly the same. You get this big open channel there. Um, this was expensive to do. It's expensive to plant that. You can usually get grant funding. But once it's there, then you're, you're not continually spending money every year. This is a similar site on Andreas and Ditch or Upper Silver Creek down south of Smith Road that was planted in the late 90s with pretty much one or one and a half rows of primarily willow right along the stream bank. Um, and it's amazing. There's no drainage problems here whatsoever. Beavers haven't found this site, which is good. <laughs> the disadvantage to the planting is you can't see the beaver dams anymore. I mean, beaver dams are everywhere. They can be in a place with only grass. They can be in a place with trees. They can be in a place with shrubs. The disadvantage of this sort of thing is you've got to get off your tractor and listen for them rather than just see them. But then you can yank them out of there just as easily. It doesn't really matter. Um, so this has been there for many, many years now. It's required no maintenance. Um, the stream is scoured down to where the field, subsurface field drains are really working beautifully now. Um, this is, here's that, that fence again, Schneider Ditch, before it was dredged. And this is what it looked like this last summer. Um, same thing. So this is where we get back into the mitigation. The mitigation we chose to do was on site and in kind. So to replace, so we did it right where it was dredged. We planted along both <coughs> sides of the stream with native shrubs, which is in kind, because what we the habitat we took out was the cover, the grass. The habitat we put back was cover in terms of woody plants. The difference is the woody plants are up above the water. So I don't know if you remember that picture where it was sort of a meander dredge channel. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Again, it's a little wider and a little deeper than what it was after the excavator left, uh, simply because the shade was established and the water course was able to have some natural ability. Silver Creek, Andreasen Ditch. This is the one we just looked at. Right here, from the air. This is a 40 acre field. So this was about 10 feet on each side, um, maybe 15 feet, which out of the 40 acres works out to be a little over an acre. Before that was planted, that acre was mostly reed canary grass and blackberries. I don't think the producer lost any field here, um, but it's been maintenance free for what, 15, 18 years now, something like that. Um, not necessarily the solution for every place, but it's worked pretty well. <coughs> questions? And I got a couple questions for you guys before we're done, too. Yeah. So when you get canary grass or grass, the fish hide along the edges under the grass. Yep. All of a sudden we got no grass, we just got these trees above. Where are the fish hide? The It's a really good question. The answer is twofold. One is that there's probably enough aquatic vegetation, the occasional branch that can in the water, whatever wood, rocks, and things like that, that gives them some cover. Is it enough? I don't know. It may well not be. Um, we talk about doing a research project to go back into some of these places and see what fish use there really is. Um, it might be that that grass is the best habitat for them. It, this is not as good for them. I don't know. Frank, could you talk about the, the proper way to go about getting beavers removed? Get the beavers themselves removed? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that is pretty easy. The, I'll, I'll just talk about beavers just a little bit. The, 1999, I think, is when the citizens of Washington passed the trapping initiative, um, which meant you had to use live traps for beavers rather than leg hold traps. 
uh, for humane purposes. About 98, 99 is also when <clears throat> the prices for beaver pelts just fell through the floor. Before that, there were tons of sport trappers and commercial trappers out there around the state catching beavers. Um, the prices of the pelt fell, commercial trappers just stopped. There wasn't, I mean, it's the same thing. If you're not getting enough for your product, you're not going to create that product anymore. You're out of business. Citizens Initiative passed, and the sport trappers also pretty much stopped doing it because it was too hard for them at that point. Beaver populations responded to that, not too surprisingly. Um, if beavers, they're an interesting, they're a rodent, they're interesting because if they're, if the population is good or the habitat is poor, they have offspring every year, not like a mouse that has it a whole bunch of times a year. Once a year, they'll have maybe two to four kits. If the eating is good and the habitat is good, they might have six or eight. The young beavers stay in the colony for two years, typically, then they disperse and go look for other habitat. Since 1999, we've seen the beaver population in western Washington just spike. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of beavers out there now that we just didn't deal with 20 years ago. Um, one of the diking districts down along the river there has been trapping 20 or 30 a year. And this is just the dike along the Nooksack River where nothing has changed other than the beavers. I mean, nobody planted trees there. Nobody introduced beavers. Nothing has changed. But there are lots of beavers there now. And 20 years ago, they weren't doing any beaver trapping. So there are lots of beavers now, and it's a big issue. Fortunately, it's fairly easy to trap them. Um, Henry Beerling's program up in Farmers Farm Friends, up in Linden, they have a contract with APHIS, which is the federal agency for wildlife management. So they have a trapper. I think it's 35 bucks an hour to have them send them out. You call Henry, and he'll have them come out, and they'll trap all the beavers you have for 35 bucks an hour. They have a license. They don't. I don't think they have to, they're not held to the, to the live trap component. There's also a couple private trappers here in the county. You as a landowner can call them. I can provide you with their contact information. And I think they're more like 200 bucks a beaver. And um, in some cases, that's money very well spent. Drainage districts typically like the private trappers because they like the idea of, of um, Get, not paying unless they get some results. Whereas with the federal guy, you're paying by the hour. And it's, he's pretty generous. I mean, if he's not catching them, he doesn't charge you many hours. But still, there's that potential for not getting too much. But yeah, you can do that. As a private landowner, you can shoot him, I think. We've got, what the, under, on the table over here after my talk, I'll put some, we have some drainage maintenance fact sheets that you can poke through. There's one on beavers. Um, we've also got some drainage maintenance manuals here, which are intended for drainage improvement districts, but if anybody wants one, you're welcome to it. Um, but yeah, as a landowner, if they're threatening your property, you can shoot them. They're not a protected species. You can't trap them without a license. You need a license for that. You can get a license from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's the contact. Um, but it's, I actually worked with a trapper a little bit one spring, and it's not as easy as I thought it would be. <laughs> so. I'd go with the, the guys that know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I've talked to a fair number of landowners and farmers that have had like a, a narrow willow buffer, like a crep buffer put in. And, and I've seen some places where the willow just grows really thick and takes over, you know, it's, uh, it, it looks like it's blocking the water. It's getting so thick. And so what's the best way to manage that kind of situation? Yep. It, it may well be blocking the water. There are some species of willow that really like to get down there in the water, and there are some that don't. On the mitigation projects that I work with now, we don't plant a lot of willows um, for that very reason, although there are some species that are more vertical and don't do that. And I haven't quite figured it out because there's some areas where we've planted willows, as you describe, and they're not anywhere near the stream. And there's other areas where they have fallen in. And at that point, even like grass, they're starting to <coughs> catch debris and back things up a little bit. Um, 
So I tend to shy away from willows now. Um, we did a planting on Johnson Creek a number of years ago, and we planted 10 different species, but whatever it was about the soil and the nutrition and everything up there, the willows were the only ones that really took off. And we're hoping it's not going to cause Jim there much problems, but we'll see. Um, so I wouldn't plant a lot of willows. I have had places on Scott Ditch where we planted them, where in just fairly short reaches, they did what you described. And uh, using the district's permit, we went in there with hand crews. I sometimes can use the, the county sheriff's office work crews. And we cleared two miles of stream in a day with five people. So it cost really very little money just to go in there and saw out the bulk of those that were causing problems. It looked like an insurmountable thing when you looked at it, but then you get in there and it really was simple and easy to do. <laughs> still had the canopy cover, there's still no grass, but we got the willows that were causing problems out and they haven't come back. It was an early life stage thing with the willows that they were growing like that. Anybody else? Peck all us another one. All right. In a, in a stream like like Johnson Creek, you know, it's it's really thick in there. Have, have you or has anyone else experimented with just mowing one side? Because those willows will coppice. You know, the, it's not going to kill most of these species. Um, but but you could experiment with just mowing like one side and pulling all that stuff out and grinding it up or something. And then and maybe if you did that every three years it would still be way cheaper than dredging it. And you wouldn't have to have per any kind of permits, I don't think, to do that. Um, when we've done these mitigation plantings, the premise has been that we've selected species that could do exactly what you described. You could mow them down to some height yep. and work in the channel and they would spring back up. Because we don't, like I said at the beginning, agriculture, drainage, here in Whatcom County is just so important. We don't want to do anything to mess that up long term. So yeah, you could probably do that. Um, it's a question of who's going to pay for it. It's always been the, the issue. Uh, some of these mitigation plantings we have are growing out into the field a little bit beyond, say, say a landowner agreed to 15 feet and now some of them are hanging out. There's this discussion a little bit in some cases about who's responsible for pushing that back in. I don't have an answer for that, but yeah, that would be an intriguing thing to try. Do you need a permit for it? Yeah, you really do. Really? For yeah. mowing? If, if you're mowing woody vegetation, it's in the critical area along the stream, you definitely need permits for that. Yep. Yep, just as much as if you were dredging. The mitigation would be considerably easier. Maybe the mitigation would be that you're not mowing them clear down to where they're dying, that they're going to spring back up and you're managing it. I would definitely make that argument. Yeah, we should do a test place. Find out. Yeah, Jim. There's new research out from Washington State University that 10 to 15 feet of a, a thick grass like fescue or something like that would do as much good as planting the trees there as far as for filtering those in the fields. Yep. Why wouldn't you plant trees only on the south bank? You're after the shade anyhow. And do a, because when you get those willows, that naturally they grow. And it's one thing, like she said, they fall in the stream, but they also fall in the fields. And sometimes when they get 20, 30 feet tall, you've got a long stretch to get out the field where you yep. got to deal with them. We've got a few sites where we've only planted one side. <coughs> um, as far as mitigation, Projects for mitigation after it's been dredged, we've always planted two sites because that's been the requirement. We've had places where a landowner has voluntarily planted one side, and we're seeing some, definitely some improvements from that, and, and that's encouraging. But is it getting all the grass out of the channel? No, it's not. On that other side, we're not getting enough shade to get the grass out. Um, so. I, you're accomplishing a little bit by planting one side, but maybe not enough. Um, and yeah, you know, a good grass filter strip in some studies probably indicates it has more of an effect of getting that, the contaminants from the field out of the stream, from keeping them out of the stream. But it doesn't have the temperature effect, which is another concern. It's not shading the, the water, so you're still getting high temperatures. Um, these little narrow buffers that 
that I've been talking about, um, they get criticized as well. They're getting harder to fund because, sure, they provide shade. I think we've pretty well documented that. But all the other habitat functions that you get from having a much wider buffer, 50 feet, 100 feet, 300 feet, you don't get from a little narrow hedgerow type planting. So, so yeah, I get it from all sides. That, you know, it's not big enough, it's way too big. It's not big enough, it's way too big. It's, and the science supports every one of those conclusions, really, is that, is that you know, this is good for, for this concern, but it doesn't address this one. And, and it's, you know, we, we juggle and we try to find the best solution.